All right. Welcome to our Tech Talks discussion, and thank you for joining us as we discuss how to foster and further develop an innovative med tech sector in the Cayman Islands. We would like to thank our sponsors, Cayman Tech City, who have partnered with Digital Cayman and Kirk ISS to make this ongoing series of engaging discussions happen. If you have any questions for our speakers today, please send those through the Digital Cayman Slack channel. It's called Tech Talks. Following the panel discussion, we will have time for a quick Q&A session and we'll read your questions then. We're thrilled to welcome our panelists today who have hundreds of patents between them and an impressive number of global med tech projects under their belts. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, I would li like to hand over the digital stage to Dr. Alan Evans, who will be facilitating today's discussion. Over to you, Alan. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, I'm Alan, and I think we'll just get started. Um, the first thing we'd really like to hear from everybody is who you are, what you do, and what brought you to Cayman. And Mark, do you want to get us started? Sure. Thanks, Alan. So my name is Mark Peterman. I'm the CEO of a company called Three Spine, SEZC. We're a uh, Cayman Enterprise City company. Uh, we have the world's first total joint replacement for the low back, uh, and it's very much like a hip or a knee. We've developed this technology over a number of years, originally in the United States, and then offshore at a large portfolio of patents uh, to Cayman. We're very excited to be in Cayman Enterprise City. We've benefited a lot from being his own company and now have operations uh, locally in the Cayman Islands through our partners, Novo Clinic Cayman and Doctors Hospital in South Africa. And uh, very very uh, shortly, we'll be starting a large study in the United States. And I'm joining you from our office in Boston. Thanks, Alan. Thanks. And then, sorry, I'm dropping the leading titles. I think pretty much everybody here is a doctor of some sort. Um, <laughs> Joanne and Frank, what brought you guys down to the island? Frank, go ahead. You're the doctor, <laughs> I thought, remember? I'm an engineer, not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, we set up a, a family business uh, a little bit over 20 years ago in Australia, generating genetically engineered mice for medical research. And the majority of our customers are in the US and Europe. So about a year ago, we thought it was probably a good idea to move closer to our main customers. and. Uh, we also wanted to live in a nice climate, and there are some other advantages of being on Cayman that everybody is well aware of. So we decided Cayman uh, was the best spot for us at the time. Well, thank you, uh, Greg. What? How about you? Sure, Greg Frost, uh, Chairman and CEO of Exuma Biotech, SECC. Um, we're a clinical stage biotechnology company that's developing adoptive cellular therapies and delivery solutions for the global oncology markets. And uh, we formed um, the entity of Exuma Biotech in 2016 uh, in Cayman. We also have operations in Asia as well as in South Florida. And so it's really been a, a phenomenal hub, both of being a great place for people from Europe coming to these areas as well as from the areas where I am in South Florida. As I like to say, it's the closest office between the two on that side around the world. Uh, thank you very much. And then Yaron, you want to tell us what you're doing here? Yeah, happy to. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Yaron Wado. I'm the chairman of the board of Doctors Hospital. Um, Doctors Hospital is a small but fine um, private hospital here in the Cayman Islands. Um, we are a medical tourism facility, and um, because of the clinical trial structure um, that is available here in the Cayman Islands, we um, are working closely with um, a couple of partners. One of the best ones is Mark, who is here with us today, um, but also um, hopefully in the future with others, um, with bringing patients from the United States mainly, but from all over the world to Cayman and um, be the platform to have first world medicine here in the Cayman Islands. Uh, thank you very much. And I think with those backgrounds, there's a lot of overlap between what some of you guys do. And I know that uh, several people here have worked together. Uh, the first interesting one, which you brought up, Yarn, was the, some of the clinical studies with Mark. Mark, do you mind talking a little bit about why you chose Cayman and, and particularly Doctors Hospital for your clinical studies for Three Spine? Yeah, absolutely. So this was a long process to decide to uh, run a study in the Cayman Islands. We've, um, at many companies in the past, have have 
have worked in uh, you know countries all around the world, in South America and Eastern Europe, uh, run pilot studies in the United States, um, Europe, et cetera. And this particular technology that we have, we originally developed at Medtronic. So we had sold this to Medtronic in the early 2000s and um, ran our first two clinical pilots in South Africa. And at the time, South Africa was completely unregulated and you could just go there and do clinical research. And um, there's some good and bad and things like that. But as we went to the next phase of the project and looked around at where we really wanted to do the study, um, we decided that Cayman was the perfect location. It's uh, regulated through the Health Practice Commission. It has laws that are very similar to the general structure of what the FDA likes to see and what the FDA has promulgated. Um, it has some unique features in that you can directly license foreign physicians, so you can bring your own team down that you're familiar with. Not that our team's any better than anybody else necessarily, but we know each other. We've operated together for years, and it significantly de-risks de your project. And it's a place that people want to come to. It's very close to the United States. It's it's uh, super nice, as you all know. And we have wonderful facilities in Cayman, like Doctors Hospital, um, that are that are just again de-risk the project. So the combination of those factors, um, along with just a nice uh, jurisdiction to do business and some other things brought us to Cayman. And again, we've done projects in other places in the world and have really benefited from uh, the environment that the Health Practice Commission has, has allowed and have now successfully completed a pretty large study in the Cayman Islands that the FDA has just accepted. Um, or will, will shortly accept uh, as uh, essentially the phase one of a, a larger U.S. study. Uh, very cool. And you, um, so you would do your next study here as well then? You'd say it's the jurisdiction you've been the most happy with for that? Yeah, so I think obviously it depends on what you want to do with the technology and with the data. Um, you know, every country in the world has their own regulatory paradigm, and so you need to think about the markets that you're trying to enter, obviously. And, you know, for many companies, the United States is the biggest market, um, followed by all the countries that accept CE marking. And it used to be that generally you would get CE marking first, and then you would go to the U.S. and Japan and other markets second. And that's changed with changes in the medical device uh, directive in Europe, and now a lot of companies are looking at the United States as the first market to enter, followed by Europe and other CE countries as second. And so the, the biggest uh, thing to think about is how do you generate uh, inhuman data in a, in a very safe um, uh, way? And then the, the cornerstone of that is informed consent. And so all clinical studies uh, need to be constructed with informed consent in mind. And we've worked really hard to design a clinical paradigm where our patients are not just, um, they're not just um, uh, uh, study subjects, but they're some of the most sophisticated healthcare consumers that you can find anywhere in the world. They're people who are interested in a higher level of care. They're very knowledgeable about the care that they're gonna receive. They do the research and they have a very good ability to understand the good and bad of participating in research. And um, some of our patients have been physicians, surgeons themselves, and they've come to the Cayman Islands to access new technology. And at the same time they're coming to, see, to access new technology, we're generating clinical data. And that's something that I think is unique in the world. I think Cayman's the only place that this unique set of uh, laws exists that you can make things like that happen. And so yes, to answer your question directly, we would foresee doing more studies in the Cayman Islands. Awesome, thank you very much for that. And I think uh, you and Yaron uh, represent the patient interaction study of generating new IP, and it, your experience there is really informative. I think if you look at what um, Joanne and Frank and Greg are doing, they, they are looking at a different set of IP. And Greg, do you mind telling us how you're generating IP and how you guys engage in the Cayman Islands? Sure. So I think if you take a look from you know, the work that we do between operations in Asia and the U.S. versus Cayman, one of the things that has been very unique is that when you look at the molecular discovery and design that happens, the world has become very flat in the ability to deploy activities around the globe. But when it comes down to the elements of, of having the creativity of people that can actually have in an undistracted environment the ability to come up with new designs, um, that's been one of the most powerful things that we've had uh, in Cayman. And frankly, one of the, the great things about it has been that while we have people domestically that have joined the company from within Cayman, we also have some great scientists that have come to Cayman from Europe 
that just frankly would not be possible in other parts of the globe. So having this area of, a, of an environment where you can bring everybody together and really focus on things, but also having excellent connectivity. So a lot of the things I think from that element when we use bioinformatics and discovery to integrate some of this data and put it all together really comes um, to a head within the team there because they're taking information from all over the globe as well as their designs going in. So there's this design, build, learn circuit that happens from that. And so when we look at the things that happen, oftentimes um, you, the first ideas come out from Cayman and they'll work through initial prototypes and we're not necessarily building massive factories or tanks for doing things there. But when they've actually built those initial systems, um, they really enable something that uh, can spread from there, whether or not it be up to the US or out between Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Shanghai, all of these areas kind of come from that. And so thinking of it as a central location for us, I think has been phenomenal from the discovery perspective. And uh, I don't think that we could have done that anywhere else. And there's people that we could not have hired, um, I think for working on these programs anywhere else. And so it's been very special that way to bring everybody together. Oh, that's excellent. And then I know Ozgene is a little newer to the island than these other companies. Have you guys started to do any IP generation here? We'll dive into some of the other stuff next. Joe? Okay, so so Ozgene itself is not on the island. What we did was because we expanded globally and we, ex we uh, expanded into the U.S., we actually then created a company on the island to be able to manage the global operations, which is a lot easier um, Cayman has the infrastructure to be able to do that, which is fabulous. But since then, we've also expanded our lines of what we want to do um, to assist the world. As you know, that we're playing in the COVID-19, um, supporting with Doctors Hospital at setting and establishing and, and running the COVID test. And as we look down, how do we continue to help the world develop and, and close that gap? You know, we will continue to develop that out of Cayman. Uh, awesome. And speaking of the elephant not in the room, because we're yeah. all doing this remotely, you had mentioned the COVID test. And I was, uh, I think for the people that aren't on the island, it's quite a testament to what has happened here in terms of, you know, it's like New Zealand or a few of the other jurisdictions where there have been no locally transmitted cases for a long period of time here. And you guys had a hand in that. And I was hoping you could talk about that a little bit and sort of how the process and the, the location and the jurisdiction help facilitate us reaching that point. So I, I, I guess coming back from what, what was said before, so Ausgene Start is, is a preclinical company and uh, the, the business model is like, like many others from there moving to the clinical side and the diagnostic side. So we had various ideas about business plans on how to do this until um, one of the panelists had his birthday here and um, so we decided to come out um, that was just at the beginning of COVID, and there was a very there was a very silly question that we asked after we had a couple of glasses of uh, fermented grape juice uh, which is uh, do we have uh, sufficient screening on the island and the answer at the, at the time was well not necessarily so given the connections that we had in the industry, then we, uh, we very quickly were able to get testing equipment out here. And Joe has a logistics background with multi-billion multinationals. So that helped us set up very, very quickly here within less than four weeks. Uh, we had the lab certified and we were actually testing together with our colleagues at the public hospital at the HSA here. So since then, as you said, we've we've done uh, the, the both sides have done, I think, a fantastic job under John Lee's guidance when it comes to track and tracing. And we haven't had any uh, community transmission since the beginning of June. So the ones that we still report are travelers, residents that are coming back in and they're coming from, I guess, what's globally known as a hotspot up north from here. So and, and that's where that's where all of our COVID cases have come from. And they're in isolation for two weeks. And so the people that are not on island, uh, we currently have life virtually as normal. Everything's open, no masks. We still do social distancing at times, but we just don't have anything here. So that, of course, is a is a very delicate balance. 
um, given that we're going to open the borders probably further in the not too distant future. And then again, it's up to us and the rest of the community and the government to maintain that diligence. So it's been it's been fantastic to be on Cayman during that time. Absolutely. Um, and what's great. Important. Sorry, I, was just gonna say, I think it's a great testament to the leadership. Also, I think within in Cayman of really taking a proactive approach on this and you know, some tough decisions that were made early on. But I think, you know, there have been very few places that I think that have been able to do this successfully. And most people don't recognize that, uh, that you know, you've been able to go through and accomplish that. So I think it's a, it's a great thing. And is it of all of our folks that are on island, um, they're the only ones that, are, uh, that are, have the mass off, so to speak, in, in certain areas, but still being very thoughtful. Yeah. Yeah, I think also um, this this whole story speaks a little bit about what's special in the Cayman Islands. Yeah, it is such a small place, and from looking at it from the outside, you would think, "Oh my God, um, sixty thousand inhabitants! How far can that get you?" But it is such a melting pot of interesting people um, that all thinking outside of the box. Because you don't come here if you just do what you learned and keep on doing what you learned. Um, and that's it. You need to think differently. And then um, I, um, Frank and I met in the tasting room of a glass of wine, as he nicely said, and um, was supposed to come for the birthday um, and sends me on Monday morning a WhatsApp um, from Perth asking, shall I bring a COVID tester? Uh, I must admit I had no clue what that would all entail um, afterwards, um, but I said, sure. And that was it. Yeah. And the thing is, um, you you find people here that bring so much to the table and you start to have trust in them because you know that um, it's kind of a little bit if you can make it here, um, you can make it everywhere. Yeah? It's um, it is a special environment. Yeah? It's a uh, um, um, it's you put a seat in the rain will come and it will grow. And that's what's special about Cayman, right? Uh, thank you. I think it's the other part of that that I find particularly interesting is you said that you were all set up in four weeks. So Mark has earlier stated that this is actually a very well-regulated jurisdiction that matches the premium health requirements of Europe and North America. But at the same time, there's enough of a baseline and enough expertise not just in the hospital systems, but in the government to expedite things in a manner that's both safe and efficient, where that might be very challenging in a different jurisdiction because of the ability to get access all the way to John Lee or any of the other um, principal deciders. Yeah, so we, so Alan, we had, uh, it, it was, I mean, the timeline uh, uh, was quite challenging because we, we not only spoke and made sure we did everything by the Cayman standards. We also had interactions with the WHO, with the Pan American Health Organization in France. We had interactions with uh, Public Health England that was out here by off chance, and then we stayed on video conferencing and so forth. So this wasn't anything set up where you would say, again, oh, this is a little island in the Caribbean. Of course it goes fast. No. This was not just above board locally, but it was above board globally. So this was uh, uh, def definitely a challenge, and there wasn't many nights where we actually did sleep. So uh, many people were saying COVID, they, they, it, it, lo it was lockdown and everybody had nothing to do. We were working crazy. But I'm, I want to really commend the help of the government and especially Dr. Lee, um, who, who kept on pushing us um, over over the finish line uh, and kept on telling us that we will get there and so with his help and his direct connection um, to the WHO and PAHO um, we could do that and um, in the end we were using modern technology like we're using now um, to get the lab certified I mean that was asking of willingness of governmental organizations like uh, like the World Health Organization and that was quite Quite powerful. Yeah. And Yaron, I think that's the beauty of Cayman is that you have a small group of people who uh, you need to get bought into an idea and moving in the same direction, where in many countries it's a gigantic group of people that need to move in the same direction. And that is one of the, the fantastic things about the Cayman Islands 
is that you have this amazing infrastructure that will pass world muster, but it's relatively straightforward to get people to understand what you're doing and to, to go along with it. I think the challenge, the next challenge is getting the world to recognize that this infrastructure exists. And I can tell you from our own experience, it's taken us a while. You know, we are an ISO 1345 uh, company, where I think we're the first med tech in Cayman to be 1345. And when our auditors came, you know, from, from our notified body, they'd never been here before. And it took them a little while to recognize that this is a very buttoned up place and um, that we were we were a buttoned up company. And I think a lot of that comes from, from the financial industry, the laws around uh, financial privacy, and a lot of uh, the things that have happened over the years to develop that industry. And I think MedTech is, can piggyback and is piggybacking right on um, that infrastructure. And most recently, we've been able to get um, our IRB, the Western Institutional Review Board, um, I think which is the premier IRB in the, in the world, to um, to really buy into the idea that Cayman is another jurisdiction that they're very comfortable overseeing in a study. And we've gotten them to buy into the idea that we can have sites in the US and the Cayman Islands and other places that are all pooling data because the data that are generated are of the same quality. And I think that's really the, the beauty of Cayman is that you have this amazing, you know, regulated environment but it functions and it functions with minimal friction. And I think you all demonstrated what can happen uh, through your COVID experience. It was fun to watch from Boston, where we were trying to do it ourselves and really struggling, <laughs> frankly, up here in the beginning. And we watched on Facebook as um, the Cayman Islands did very, very well. That's a, a really great, actually, a position for feedback sitting in Boston. So. Thank you. I, I would say with the, the recent success and the, I'd say small but growing med tech community here, what do each of you see as next steps for maybe your business or for the ecosystem in general here over the next one to three years as, you know, <clears throat> hopefully the world normalizes a little bit? Uh, if I may start, I think um, the main problem that we have is the um, is the name of the Cayman Islands out there. Um, I think that people who have never been here, who have not uh, interacted um, with the people that do business here, um, have no idea. They, they, I think they're still in um, the movie The Firm with um, from the 80s. Um, and that's simply not true. And also when I, I'm originally from Germany, when I speak with my German friends, um, by now they know, but in the beginning, they thought, ah, you're going to a Caribbean island. That can't be too special. And it, the opposite is true. Um, we have um, such a modern um, hospital and the uh, equipment, I'm, I'm, I'm in MET, yeah, radiology is MET. Um, and yeah, we had the first um, digital mammography unit and the first um, 3D mammography unit the, the same month that it was FDA approved. Um, we are keeping investing into the um, into hardware, depending on what the people need that come um, here with us. We bought a, we started a new um, cath lab service for cardiac stuff, and we went to a new new machine that does it, and that's actually a C arm, so you can do cardiac cath labs with it. But so when Mark and his doctors come, um, they can use that machine um, like in a hybrid OR and um, get images that with a normal ORC arm you cannot get. Um, same happens um, with the MRI. We have a three Tesla MRI and it's um, we're about to buy a 512 slice CT. So this is very cool, but and it sounds great, but it means in the end that um, the infrastructure that we have, um, if one of the um, patients has something that goes beyond the scope of what is expected, we can deal with it. Um, and that's something you must never forget. It's like, you go and it's like, okay, you do, um, you do your operation. Um, that's fine as long as it works, but sometimes there's a hemorrhage or there's something, something that is completely within the statistical things that go wrong, but you need to be able, someone who lies on the table might have a heart attack. So you need a cardiologist and he needs to be able to deal with it. 
Um, so, and we have all that, and that I think makes it very special. Um, Balance back brought down a 7D um, stereotactic unit that is state of the art, doesn't use um, radiology to know whether, with the, um, maybe Mark can talk more about this, where they are with their knives. And it's, it's spectacular when you watch that. It's a million dollar machine that just happens to be on the Cayman Islands um, that's being used by our surgeons. Yeah, the reason we were able to get that down to the Cayman Islands is not because we were able to pony up a million dollars. <laughs> That's a lot for one piece of equipment for us. But um, when we talked to the vendor, who is a very high tech startup from Toronto that's getting a lot of traction and said, you know, we'd like to use your machine. Would you be willing to place one at our center? We obviously paid for it, but uh, not that much. They said, really in the Cayman Islands? Sure, that'd be great. <laughs> And they view it as an opportunity to bring people to came in to train. And so there's a natural synergy where people are interested in what we're doing uh, and they're interested in what they're doing. And if you ask a surgeon to come and do a demonstration of this new tech in Toronto in the winter, you get one answer. If you ask them to come to Grand Cayman in the winter, you get another answer. And I know we're all smiling, but we should take advantage of that. That's a big deal. It's all so close. There's direct flights from so many wonderful cities, and um, and that's a major feature. Mark, I think that's a great point, and I'll just add one other element that you guys have brought up prior to this, in that Cayman really sits as a nexus between the U.S. and Europe with very convenient direct flights to both, and it also creates a really great place for both CE certified and other certified equipment to come to allow for training from medical professionals from the other jurisdiction as well. So uh, thank you. I, we can move on to um, Greg in terms of how do you see the next one to three years in your, your relationship with Cayman? Yeah, I think it's an interesting, you know, evolution that's happened where, mm -hmm. you know, as we kind of work our way through the circuits of obviously we do a lot of clinical development around the world. But I think that, you know, some of the next steps for us will be one, of course, getting some of the core analytical method development working there. Because when we look at these things, um, when you're developing, you know, cell and gene therapies, a lot of the vectorology and work that's done and the reference standards and stability, these are things that take a tremendous period of time to develop that data. But there are also things, I think, which from... The, the competency that we have there, and also I think as far as the infrastructure can serve very well. So I would look on the basis of when you look at that work of developing your methodologies in place, even early on you may be tech transferring those to other locations where there may be manufacturing. The next wave of that gets down to things of, you know, people talk about stability and, and understanding your materials. These become things which are absolutely critical when you look over the long time frame that it takes on complex biological materials like you know, gene vectors to come together. So I think that will be an area that we'll be able to do a lot there in the future. And I think it's something that fits very well with the people there that have, you know, work with the base molecules, but they're also the people that know how to dissect them and really understand them um, mechanistically. So that's certainly a place which, while it's, you know, some people don't appreciate the value of that, you know, the reference standards that you develop for the world, um, you know, they're some of the most precious things you develop in biotechnology, and they're things that have to remain constant over decades. So I think that is something for which we see as very achievable. There's so obviously, um, there's additional work that will need to be done, I think, in opening some avenues in different areas to, to get that to work. But generally speaking, I see it as an, a very achievable thing to do and look forward to it. Frank and Joanne? Yeah, maybe Joe can talk a little bit about what we're involved in right now, which gives us sleepless nights. So as we as we mentioned before, we talked about you know doing the COVID testing, and so um, because of our connections around the world, we're now really embarking on a phase two, phase three um, study for the vaccine. Uh, so we're spending a lot of time making the connections, making sure that we are using the right supply chain, we are using the right um, con group connections to get governmental approval. But based on that, that will take that will take not not only give Cayman the ability to open up 
and bring tourism back and protect the island, which would be fabulous because now you've got that whole dynamic of the island really going back to function the way it was. But number two is it will bring us to a whole other level of doing more and more studies and new stuff on the island that when you really think about it, we will establish the platform and the ability now to help bring the education and bring people to be able to be developed in other fields than came has been traditionally known for. Oh, that's awesome. That's that's actually super cool. And I think it's worth um, mentioning and asking the question around uh, Cayman's a jurisdiction where people can actually pay to be part of trials, I believe. Uh, do you think that, you know, a possible early success there and um, the awareness on the world stage that will come to Cayman, do you think it might also drive uh, certain well-to-do tourists that might want to move to the front of the line, so to speak, as a way to possibly even accelerate the the tourism economy here. I, I'll probably hand that one on to Yaron. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> okay. Honestly, for me, I must really say, um, it was very funny, we were um, um, talking to the to the guy who actually um, invented that vaccine, and um, we were trying to just trying to sell him to come to the Cayman Islands and work out of him. Um, and, um, obviously, there are many good things we can talk about about the Cayman Islands, but the thing that came straight to my mind is we are COVID free, and you should come here. You don't need a mask, nothing. We are COVID free, and he was just shaking his head and said, "I don't care. I'm vaccinated." And that was such an eye opener for me. It was such an eye opener for me. So like suddenly the problem that everybody else, you can say like, hey, your problem, not mine. I got a, got a shot. And um, so I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm praying and hoping that um, Frank and Joe can get this over the finish line. Um, the sooner the better. Um, I, it is the most exciting thing um, I think um, I've heard in a very long time, um, and it's unbelievable that we can play on the, if we are able to, to play on this international level. And when Frank and I were talking about it, he's like, well, you don't think it's going to make us a lot of money. I said, look, this is the Olympics. Being part of it, yeah, and playing in it is what it's all about. Yeah, if we've, what have you done during COVID? Well, I was locked up. We were part of the solution. And it's fantastic. It is fantastic. So um, I'm, uh, but yes, to go straight straight back to your question, if I um, would be very wealthy and I would want to get rid of the COVID problem for myself, I would take the next private jet land down here. Um, wouldn't even bother with um, going for two weeks in quarantine and just say, "Give me, give me a shot." Thank you. I'm out of here. Well, you might not leave right away. You might not. Yeah, yeah. That's the next thing. We will have to work on it. We have to keep the people here. I think. I really think that this whole COVID experience, when you look how Cayman measures up against the rest of the world, um, we have an opportunity to play in the next league, yeah, in the next level. It's just it's obvious to me, and this is one of those possibilities. It's. Um, and I've, I've heard um, a couple of people on the, um, the immigration lawyers saying that they have like 2,000 um, high net worth individuals waiting um, for the borders to open. They buy real estate unseen over the internet to be able to come here. This, I think, will come out of this crisis um, as a complete like Monaco and Monte Carlo. Yeah. And back to this yes. idea of, of, of cash for paying for care, you know, I think that's a really important point. And we're talking about it in the context of, of a vaccine, but it stretches across all of medicine. And it's our belief that this is the future of medicine. And if you look at most places around the world, there's a two tiered system. There's a public system and there's a cash based system. Right. Um, and health insurance is a funny thing. You know, we all think of health insurance as something that you have to have and it's somehow better to access care with insurance but health insurance is the only insurance product that you buy with the intent of using 
right? You don't intend to use your car insurance or your life insurance, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, you intend to use your, your health insurance and, and that creates all kinds of perverse incentives that don't help the patient and they certainly don't help the cost of care. And when you take that away, all kinds of good things happen. And you know, if you look at a system like we have up here in the United States where it's entirely fee-for-service based, you have to always ask the question, is the doctor doing what the doctor's doing because it's in your best interest or because it pays better? And uh, that is a very fair question that every patient should ask. And when the patient's paying the bill, that just goes away. And um, you can actually focus on the episode of care and what's in the best interest of patients. And it's just an amazing thing. And there have been some experiments where people just don't use insurance, where they just don't take insurance and healthcare gets better. And then if you take that to the next level and you ask the question, well, what happens if you do clinical research where the patient shoulders the burden of um, the cost of care? I'm not talking about treating desperate patients for high dollars or charging people to access new technology. I'm saying you come to the Cayman Islands, we take care of you and the, the pure fees, the nursing fees, the hospital bed um, and stuff, you pay for it. And it's a very affordable and in many cases, the bill is less than what your copay would have been using your regular insurance back home. And maybe you get, you know, a CE Mark product or an FDA approved product or whatever, but maybe you get new technology and you just put that decision in the patient's hands. When you allow that also, which is, is, is something that you can do in the Cayman Islands, good things happen. And you can really drive innovation and you can allow patients to access the technology that they want, again, with informed consent being the cornerstone of that, um, and good things happen. And I really think that's the future, not just in the Cayman Islands, but everywhere is cash-based medical care that's administered in a new way. And I think that Cayman can be you know, a leader in that, not just in terms of medical research, but in terms of medical travel, destination healthcare, as it's known uh, in some corners. And um, this is gonna be a very, very big industry. Oh, thank you very much for that. And. Um, in terms of informed consent, uh, I live in the islands, obviously, and if that trial goes forward, I'm happy to be very right at the front of the line. So <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely read everything and give informed consent, but that's very exciting because it's a chance to be part of, I think, something very big and, and continuously beneficial for the island and the reputation of it. Yeah. So we got a few minutes it, left it, before questions, and I figure it I'll is int it interesting. No, go yeah, ahead. So sorry. it's interesting what interesting what you just said Alan because when when we go around and we talk with people that's usually the response that we get that uh, you know in other places you have trouble filling your 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 contingents that you need to get into a clinical trial and what we're hearing here is uh, can I get in the front row mm -hmm. and uh, and that's not just old white guys uh, or younger white guys uh, because we we have we have a very good cross section of uh, of an ethnic diverse population here, so I'm I'm hearing it from from everywhere, and and I must admit we have started to collect names, so when things happen, so we can actually jump uh, immediately and reduce the lead time significantly from what otherwise is is a is a hindrance and roadblock. So we got a few. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes left. I would say there's some infrastructure that doesn't exist here yet that is in the process of being considered or existing that might open up more things uh, the the next high-speed underwater fiber optic cable some changes that we might have seen during the COVID era to logistics practices that allowed for accelerated you know priority goods to get in to enable that um, potential production in the Cayman Islands and, and so the elements of education and maybe a, a local training for med tech and what that looks like. I mean, you're just starting to see seeds for a lot of this planted. So I'm curious if each of you puts on your sort of forward looking hat. And I know the waters are turbid of the future are turbid. If, but if you look, what do you guys see 10 to 15 years out and what what enabling things that might not exist yet drive that? So I'll start. I'll start this one a little bit, um, and I'll put on my engineering hat for it. But when I take a look at what's what's really happening now, and you go back way, you know, way back when the finance industry and everything else started, and that kind of bubbled up. What you're seeing now in medtech 
go 10 years down, they'll be as strong as the finance industry is on the island, right? And the whole education system will have developed and you'll have breast practice sites that people can go and test out. And there will be uh, manufacturers around the world that want to put their test equipment here, right? And we can experience it firsthand. So I see that really developing. Um, are there barriers that need to be changed? Yes. You know, getting hazmat material in is always a challenge. But the more we broach those and have the conversations, the more we see that carriers are willing to be able to do the right things to get there. So I think it's a conversation that just will evolve as we start to develop. I mean, we've, we've seen we've seen some of the we've seen some of the uh, you know talking to people in particularly in the special economic zone in terms of logistics challenges that we have. These yeah. challenges have been completely removed by the government uh, for the COVID side. So we, we can order things in the US and have them here in a not too dissimilar timeline that you would be able to get them in Boston. So there is, uh, so it, we know it can be done, and we know that customs here has has been able to to cope with it, cope with it very well, and has opened that, that at least for us. And I know on the COVID side, and I know that in other areas that is at the moment not that straightforward. But we now have shown, uh, they have shown how it can be done. So I think that will open up a new, uh, a very new way of of doing uh, freight in to Canada. Well, I know that awesome. when some people look at this, uh, you know, there's the old adage of amateurs talk strategy and professionals talk logistics. And I know, Joan, from a logistics perspective, you know, your your experience base working on the island, being able to go in and think about that. Do you think that's something that uh, people develop more of an appreciation for as far as working from that perspective and, and maybe things that you've seen changing that... Uh, You've learned some rules, kind of uh, of the road going forward, that uh, that may get more efficient over time. Well, I think they get more efficient because people become more aware of it. So, because I've worked on logistics yeah. around the world, there are things that exist today that always have yeah. existed, yeah. but on the island, they never knew that and didn't think about it. So, I think it's just the exposure that you can get. Um, but number two is the more interactions you do with places around the world, much easier to build that connection. Like when we started the COVID lab, getting material here was the toughest thing because they hadn't done, you know, a company hadn't made that path to the, to the Caribbean yet. Now yeah. it's done like that. It's a normal order put in, it makes the route, it makes the stop in Miami, it hits the plane, it goes. So it's yeah, just exactly. exposure. And then Mark and Yaron, how do you see the let's say the 10 year roadmap, particularly that you do much more, I'd say direct patient interaction. Yeah, so I can start Yarn, and you can ch ch chime in on the on the patient side of things is because you have obviously a lot of plans to grow to grow your facility. But I, I see an ecosystem developing. It's already happening. Um, and and so really what's going to make med tech a pillar of the economy, which is I, I think what everybody wants or is is an ecosystem. And we have elements of that ecosystem already. I think one of the first steps is came in Enterprise City. You know, there's hundreds of companies in the zone. Um, some of them are helpful if you're a med company. Maybe there's not so many med companies yet, but there will be. You know, we've been helped enormously by Barry Quapez, uh, Cayman Healthcare Consulting to get off the ground. That firm exists. Anya Gale at Nova Clinic has helped us. She's our licensee in the Cayman Islands and, and has really helped blaze the trail for the concierge side of our business. And then obviously everything that Yaren, uh, Ed Hansen and the team have done at Doctors Hospital is, is, is very impressive. But you need a whole ecosystem, right? So you need education. Um, we have a couple of schools that we could work with. We have a medical school as well. Um, and you need uh, opportunities to, uh, to manufacture and uh, you need jobs for people to come back to when they go to advanced training, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as that ecosystem develops, I think it's very realistic to think that there can be a robust med tech sector that has everything from venture capitalists to parts coming out of a plant in the Cayman Islands that provides jobs for Caymanians. And we've had some really interesting conversations with um, the deputy premier and with Charlie about what we could be doing on the Brock as an example. And a few years ago, it was honestly hard for me to imagine making our stuff on Cayman Brock. But now I was recently in Philadelphia at Drexel 
And the newest generation of 3D printers that they're getting out of Germany, they just arrive in a crate, you literally plug them into 110 voltage, and you can start making parts. And with some very basic, you know, two-year technical school kind of training, you can have people standing in front of those machines making parts. I came back from Philly and said, wow, you know, we could actually do this. We can't do it today, but two or three years from now, absolutely. And I think if we just continue to develop an ecosystem and we work together and we connect those dots again from venture, you know, dollars the whole way through the system to making parts, you'll see an ecosystem develop and it will become a pillar of the economy. Uh, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think the ecosystem is the word. Um, just that we all sit here together in this meeting shows you what the ecosystem means. And um, for Doctors Hospital, we are pushing forward. It um, has been, we took over, the doctors kind of took over the hospital from Dr. Tomlinson four and a half years ago. Um, um, Dr. Hodges, who works with Mark, actually was in conversation with us already and I just found it, the, the old um, pamphlet that we did 2012 and 2011. So that's how long this, things take time. Uh, we are actually, we, are, we, we signed an MOU with Baptist Health in Miami. So they're helping us with policies and procedures um, and getting, um, getting that kind of logistics. And by the way, Greg, I'm gonna keep this um, amateurs talk, <laughs> um, talk future and um, professionals talk logistics. So the logistics is such a big thing. So we can talk about so many things, how they're done in Miami in a proper center. And, um, um, very soon we will be able to kind of plug us in with so many things we can do on island and everything that we cannot do on island, we can still integrate off island to then do here, like with um, cancer patients that then can go to the Miami Cancer Institute, have a telemedicine consult with a um, with the oncologist that will give the radiation, the ra radiation oncologist that will plan the radiation for the patient with our oncologist being there. The patient only has to go there, gets a specialized treatment that you only get at the big centers. Mm -hmm. Miami Cancer Institute invested a billion dollars. You can't just bring that down here. Yeah, it, Miami has to see if they can actually make this work. Um, but you get, you get access to technology, access to the, um, to the protocols they're using in Sloan Kettering in New York, through Miami, then here, and with the tide, all boats rise. And so I just see um, us sitting in the middle of it and being the biggest people alive to have the sun and the sea at the same time. Ah, uh, yeah, the sun and the sea and COVID free. Uh, <laughs> how I would great say slogan. it personally. Put that up. There's, there's a tagline, I like that one. <laughs> yeah, no, but, uh, uh, anyway, I think it, it's very interesting. It sounds like the, the current world situation actually might be a catalyst to accelerate what was already uh, very substantial med tech efforts in the island, which is really exciting. So we're a little bit over time. So thank you, everyone. And what happened thank now you. is we'll we'll see one if we can get Kaylin to come back and bring us questions. Do it. I wanted to ask Mark to please show the Cayman OR of Doctors Hospital in Boston. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And Mark, if you're okay with showing that, we'll bring Caitlin in at the same time to ask questions. Yeah, so, so, so this will be the, two for one. This will be the closing credits of the meeting. So we we actually <laughs> copied exactly in our office here in Boston an exact copy of the operating room in um, in Grand Cayman that we use, and we did it just so the doctors that were training here in this facility could feel like they were in Yarn's OR but it's all fake, it's all vinyl graphics. There's no window. <laughs> and Yarn got to kick it out earlier. So thanks, that was kind of a fun way to play. <laughs> oh, uh, too, in Boston. Very good Hi, meeting. Thanks, Bob. All right. Are we ready for some questions? Absolutely. All right. So the first one's from Eva. And they say, are there initiatives on island to start building up a med tech incubation hub with international connections that include mentorships and startup structuring. All right, who's got I that? Think, I, yeah. I think that's a that that's a CEC answer, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's that's how we got here in the first place. 
So yeah. we are part of Cayman Enterprise City, and that's that's I think Alan. I don't know. That's what we do every day. Yeah, I, I think it is definitely a, a focus of CEC, and you, this meeting, for example, is uh, the start of that coming together. And I'm sure a lot of these companies would be happy next time you place interns to take take your call and place interns and yeah. see how it continues to grow going forward. Yeah, it's something I, I, I'm interested in for sure, and I can. You know, we don't have specific, we haven't done specific work in the area of trying to create, you know, mentorship or things like that. But I can tell you, we have done quite a lot of work to, to think through what it takes to train people to help us in our business and involving, um, you know, some expat assignments for local people to go to specific schools for specific classes and come back, et cetera. So it's all part of the ecosystem. I think it's a great thing that when you looked at big picture wise, you know, the, the trees in Med tech and biotech, they grow slowly, and so, but the, but the core element is when there's success that is there, when that tree is formed, what naturally will happen is that you know the seeds that come off that tree result in people then going through and doing more innovation and starting new endeavors because they've learned how to do specific things, and so I think the exciting thing when you look you know anywhere where these things have happened is that. There's always a lot of impatient people saying, is it, is it there yet? <laughs> or the fruit on the tree yet? But I think that the element is um, that success happens. And then what happens from that is that the mentorship that occurs, you know, and you have a good nurturing environment. There's, there's a great environment down there, I think, of an infrastructure to support it. And when that does happen, then I think you have both local individuals that get that mentorship opportunity and then others that see it from a opportunity where it becomes a cluster. But it's, uh, you know, across the world, these are things that uh, everyone looks to say, what does it take for the experiment to work? And there's a few ingredients necessary for the trees to grow. Um, you need the sunshine, you need the water and other things to go in. But, but the core piece is the success that comes from an entity doing something and working well, that in the end is what ensures the success of, of future generations of it. And so I, I look at the people down here and say, you know, I think the environment and the CEC is very, very supportive. You know, you get on island and you look around and very quickly they can walk you through all the key areas to help you get started. But I think on the, the overall element, it still is, it's a young industry. It is around the world, but uh, I think it's got uh, very good promise. And yeah. The other part is that the companies that are here are also connected around the world as well. So even though it's very, you know, in its infancy on the island, the reality is we can take people to go elsewhere to learn to come back. So it's got the connections that a lot of places just don't have all the time. Yeah. As long as you're willing to move. No, I mean, I just want to point this out because I always want this sort of platform. And it's all there. You don't need somebody else to fix it for you. You just need to be willing to get out of your box and see what is out there and then come back and take advantages that the Cayman Islands give you. And it's uh, interesting. I had so many medical students shadow me at doctor's hospital. And I would say 50% of them now um, considering coming here after they've gone through the a residency program, the medical school residency program, they, they want to come back and now practice here in the Cayman Islands. And I, I mean, this is this is exactly what Greg is talking about. It's, but it takes time. This takes years. Um, but um, but we are all happy to help for, for, for young people. There is the um, University College of the Cayman Islands um, used to run, I don't know if they do it anymore, they used to run a STEM special where they invite all the um, schools in, and I was um, happy to talk there um, a couple of years. Um, and it's this is this is, and we talked about this before. You you need to make you need to have the place. If you are a bright young Kamenian and you go into STEM, you you we need to have the industry here to attract these people to come back and play a proper part in it. Yeah, um, and not only do the two year thing. But go, go to university, get specialized, invent something, and then come back and say, I can do this at home. Exactly. Excellent. Well, the next question I have here is, um, can you explain why appropriate regulation is a good thing? 
and how Cayman's regulations compare to other jurisdictions? Mark? Yeah, that's Mark's question. <laughs> So, so you have to be regulated. If you're not regulated, nobody takes it. Nobody will take your data seriously. And I'm speaking just purely from a med tech standpoint. So you have to have regulation. Um, so, for example, if you look at our company again, we're ISO 1345. That's entirely voluntary. There's no reason to do that other than just to demonstrate that we have a quality system that can pass muster, right? Um, but if you generate clinical data in a jurisdiction that's not regulated, it's not real clinical data. You know, it, whether it's good, well collected or not, you know, it's not going to pass international muster. But if you have laws like we do um, in Cayman that are um, that are, there's that gives you a framework to have studies approved that are monitored by IRBs and are again have the proper informed consent. Um, you can run some really excellent clinical studies. What's unique about Cayman compared to some place like the United States is that there's just not as much case law. And so the laws are there. They are good laws and they're just they're just not all that well developed. So there is room for interpretation. Um, and in, in that, you know, sometimes you're using a particular part of a law for the very first time and people haven't seen it. And you have to walk them through what it means. You don't have reams and reams of case law to rely on to understand what this means. And But this is exactly what Europe's going through right now. If you look again, I mentioned earlier the MDR, uh, the Medical Device Directive, um, that, you know, the big challenge that we have with implementation of that new rule in Europe is that nobody has the first idea how to use it. And as a result, no one's going to use it. And you're going to see companies stop all of their medical research in that jurisdiction because it's just too hard. And so that's the key. You need to have uh, regulation, but it has to be appropriate regulation that vendors can use and they can be successful and they can get to the end of the line on a reasonable amount of capital. Um, and so regulation is is a cornerstone of all med tech development, whether it's quality systems to do the development itself or the regulatory compliance framework to do uh, to run the studies. So you have to have it, but you have to have appropriate levels of regulation. Yeah, and I think Mark, um, and you can correct me if I'm painting a parallel for my own understanding, is Cayman also has very good uh, banking and legal uh, laws regulation. Yep. And that very, very sound financial and legal legislation as a regulatory body enables a lot of companies to actively be here and allows people to trust their finances. Absolutely. So if Cayman didn't have any banking regulation or any legal regulation, uh, the world wouldn't respect companies that were registered here because in a very similar way that they wouldn't expect or respect medical results. Yeah, so just, that's, that's how I think about it anyway. Yeah, and on that point, these regulatory paradigms are synergistic too. So, so you look at the ecosystem that exists around, um, you know, finance. You have, you know, advisory and private banking and tax and lawyers and everything like that that have created this wonderful ecosystem. And there are really well-developed laws, you know, uh, that that, uh, that that have come out of that. And so, take take patient privacy laws as an example. Cayman doesn't have like a HIPAA equivalent to the United States where there's specific rules around patient privacy yet that's developed to the level that the HIPAA laws are in the US. But we have really, really uh, strong uh, financial privacy rules that overlap that. And so really it's the same, gives the patient the same amount of protections because you're required as a vendor to protect the personal data because of the finance laws. And so there's an example of synergies between finance and med tech that people probably don't even recognize exist that allow our patients, many of whom who are extremely sophisticated, as I, as I mentioned, to be comfortable um, sharing patient data in the jurisdiction. This is an example of, of the synergies. Hey, excellent. Um, Bianca asks, in your opinion, what's Cayman's biggest competition for attracting med tech businesses? Maybe there's another jurisdiction that's out there that we should keep an eye on? Greg, yours is probably well, the most movable. Well, I guess I would say if you really step back and look, um, you know, most places that have smart people, good infrastructure, stability, and small footprints are often the places that are thinking about med tech because it aligns very well with that. Um, and so, Many, many places, um, you know, I think have experimented with these things in different, different ways. Um, you take a look at a place like Singapore, which probably started this much longer ago than, than Cayman did. And even though people would look and say, you know, you go in and say, well, if you want to be in Singapore, you do have good education, you have good connections in another side of the world. 
Um, but at the same time, people look and say, you know, we're not going to build things this way. You have to build up and down to make it work. And so I think um, that commonality, when you look and say, um, it's in good company of, of, I think, that aspiration, say it can fit in that sort of a system. Um, so I think if you were to look, you know, it is, there's, there's some places that have tried and have failed. And people put three of the ingredients of maybe five that you need in that place, and they'll experiment with it for a while and say it didn't work, and they walk away, and so that was a bad experiment. Um, but I do think that uh, in general, um, this, is, this is a location which has, has the ability to meet the needs in, in that same sort of way when you look forward and is a good aspirational direction. Well, I, I want to add that we are close to the United States. We are English speaking. We are safe. Um, that we have location, location, location. Yeah. So uh, the other thing is management, 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 and this is what we are building yeah. up on. But um, we are on track. I must really say. Yeah. I mean, I look at it personally, and I say, from the South Florida side and and Cayman, it's a lot different than going to New York and and then doing two flights to get to Singapore or going to Shanghai and other areas. It's a it, from a location side, and it's very feasible to do. And you know, it's is easier than going to New York when you look from the standpoint of, of you know, in environments where, uh, where we have uh, good controls in place. I think also um, the European influence, when you look at Cayman very much, while it's situated in a location that's very close to the U.S., it does have much more of a European flavor to it that I think when you look at the, the common law and other elements, it's very familiar if you spend time in Europe of understanding, I think, the systems and structures that, that work really nicely. Yeah, and I think if you look at the jurisdictions around the world, back to the question of where else, who else are we competing with, you know, people are traveling for, for technology and for cost, and um, those are different, right? So people go to Costa Rica, as an example, all day long because they have a very well-developed healthcare system. Uh, it's also a nice place to be. Um, and uh, and they can access low cost care uh, in a place like Costa Rica. You know, if you have serious serious cancer, you probably should go to MD Anderson. <laughs> I would. You know, you probably need to go to a place like that, or if you have a very serious deformity, maybe you go see Dr. Lanky at Columbia. But but other than a couple of special cases like that, you know, people are generally traveling for cost and tech. And the beauty of Cayman is you can get both. You can get new tech at a reasonable cost, and it's close. And I really think that's a huge advantage uh, that we have here uh, over other locations. Great. We've got a question here from Nick. They ask, have you seen a significant surge in funding since the COVID outbreak? Any increase in funding? And you notice maybe just generally across the sector? It, it is the question, is there an increase in interest in med tech funding or medical funding or the medical sector? Have you seen a significant I, surge in funding? Yeah, hmm. in the med tech sector. That's an easy question. I mean, think globally, when you take a look at it, um, look, innovation in science is something that um, it's very much often forgotten by people when you look at all the things and say that, you know, they're looking at their iPhones, they're looking at their technology and other things, and no offense to people in, in the tech side of, of the world, but healthcare in general and science to solve new problems, um, I think the general focus um, of people realizing how important, you know, science and medicine is to solving problems when they show up um, I think people have realized, not just from an economic return and what's my ROI going to be, but from a pure element of saying there's so much that can be solved that I wouldn't say that you've seen altruistic investment happening. Every investor that will go in and put something in is, is looking for a fair return. And uh, if anybody knows us, it's not in a, in a true nonprofit, um, I'm sure they'd be happy to give you the link. But for the most part, I think investments have picked up because people have realized that there's a need for, for innovative medicine. And if we're going to solve problems like COVID-19, if we're going to solve problems like cancer, immunology, orthopedics, that 
maybe just a very little bit, there's been more interest in healthcare investment because people looked and said and understood it better because it's been at the top of their minds. So I would say that investment in healthcare has gone up simply because people that weren't paying attention to it and maybe were out chasing, you know, the next app have looked at it and said, this is a huge unmet need and have become more aware about the regulatory process, the science and the development, because people are watching it on their screens at night. You know, it's, it's like a war that people are fighting and all of a sudden you realize it's very important. So I think for no other reason than that, it is, uh, it has been improving greatly. Great. Um, this is one of the final questions that I'll ask today because I'm aware we're running short on time. But it's uh, from Pearson's. They ask, what are your thoughts as med techs regarding the timing of the introduction of vaccines in Cayman? And then McNabb's asks, is there, do you have any thoughts about the bio button versus geofencing, geofencing options? So two different questions, but uh, Joanne and Frank, you probably are the most qualified to answer the first one. <laughs> well, uh, well, I'll talk about our desires and then Frank can talk about the rest of it. Um, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're obviously pushing very hard. The phase one is done um, and part of phase two has started. Um, all the data is there. We really want to, you know, get things up and running and have laid it out based on all the processes that are required to be able to do that in the next in the next eight weeks to 10 weeks. So we're looking and pushing pretty hard that, you know, come Q this end of this year that we're fully in, um, approved up and running and, and, and playing. So that's what we're driving to at least. And if there's anything people listening can do to help facilitate, feel free to ask them. Absolutely. So as, uh, as this is now the third time we bring up the professional and the logistics, so we've been spending time with the, the, the seriously large manufacturers around the world uh, because um, it, it, they're all at capacity. So everybody's asking, can you make us this protein? Can you make us this virus? And can you do it faster? And in the end, you know, there, there is always a, um, a weak link in the chain that, that we haven't quite seen yet. And I think that's what, what will be causing uh, for us, but for everybody around the world issues. And we've just seen AstraZeneca's Oxford uh, vaccine go on hold. And I, I, think, I think we're going to see that more and more and more because the statistics uh, for vaccine development haven't changed just because of COVID. Um, and as uh, Yaron said, it's, it's an Olympics and there will be more than, than one um, you know, gold, silver, and bronze medal, and we are we are confident, like many others are, that that we can deliver. And the timing, certainly coming from a lean background, is is always our focus to minimize the lead time. So yes, I'd like to think we can go into phase three well before Christmas, um, and phase three would cover more than half of the island. So I think we can then just ease it into a phase four. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I think, Yaren, uh, in regards to the bio button question, uh, I don't know, are you probably the most familiar with? Well, I know, I know what it is about. Um, the bio button is actually a system that um, measures, builds a baseline. So what it does, it's like it sits on your skin um, and measures your temperature, um, your heartbeat, um, and by that can then um, try this. I don't know if it can do it, but it tries to find a baseline of what you are when you're healthy to then find out and flag you as possibly sick um, after a couple of days when your heart rate goes up and your, um, uh, and your temperature goes up. And it's supposed to know or understand if you go into the sun and in the sea, it's watertight. Um, I know Dr. Lee was wearing it for a while and some um, guys at Dart have been playing around with it. And what I hear from them is it seems to be working mostly. And um, um, the geofencing part of it is only a little thing because only hindsight, you can only find out later that someone didn't go. I mean, you know, it's kind of quick, but still it's like you don't have someone um, standing watch in front of everybody's house uh, to hold somebody up who goes out. But, so that's the part of it. But going back to the vaccine, I think the main problem that we are going to face um, is going to be the loss of the public in 
modern medicine, in, mo in medical technology. I mean, obviously, all of us are all believers in it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here where we are. Um, but I think we um, we have lost a lot of the public at this. And I think um, in the end, once the vaccine is there, we'll have to tell them, choose your poison. Yeah? Um, you're afraid of a vaccine. We tell you it's safe. Um, you're afraid. You're, you're less afraid from getting COVID and landing on ICU um, in prone position and intubated. Um, choose your poison. And I think this is, there's a lot of work that will need to be need to be done in that direction um, to get the herd immunity to be able to open up um, and get everybody to buy in on that. I think that's the biggest obstacle I foresee. That makes a lot of sense, Jarn, and I I think hopefully that because of the success with both the administration's communication during the COVID crisis and now the, the success of it not being on island, that hopefully not just the medical community, but the, the politicians on island have earned a lot of the trust of the local community. And that we'll see a higher rate here than we might in my home country, the US, where maybe that trust isn't as mutual as it is here. Yep, that's right. <clears throat> All right. Any other well, any other big questions, Caitlin, or are you good? I'm good. I mean, there's still some conversations going online through the Slack channel, so please do continue the conversation there. But um, before we I conclude today's event, is there any final words that you want to tell the audience or final thoughts? Go, came in. Yeah. <laughs> See you inside. <laughs> Yep. Excellent. Well, thank you very much to our speakers for your thoughtful insights. It's exciting to watch the sector grow and develop here in Cayman, and we certainly look forward to seeing what's next. Um, for everyone who's watching, again, please continue the conversation online through the Digital Cayman Slack channel. Um, Cayman Tech City and Digital Cayman are on a mission to support Cayman's growing digital tech sector, so please do get involved. Um, visit digitalcayman.com for membership details. Last but not least, a special thank you to Kirk ISS for their technical support today. And I guess that wraps things up. So thank you everyone again, and we'll see you at the next event. Thank you, Thank Caitlin. you. Bye. Goodbye. Take care.